As you read down the long list of kings and queens of England, you'll find the great names of which we are familiar with. But often omitted is a little known queen who ruled for just nine days. This is the history of Lady Jane Grey. Lady Jane Grey was the eldest daughter of Henry Grey, first Duke of Suffolk, and his wife, Frances. The traditional view is that she was born at Bradgate Park in Leicestershire in October 1537, while more recent research indicates that she was born somewhat earlier, possibly in London, sometime before May 1537, or between May 1536 and February 1537. This would coincide with the fact that she was noted as being in her 17th year at the time of her execution. Frances was the eldest daughter of Henry VIII's younger sister, Mary. Jane had two younger sisters, Lady Catherine and Lady Mary, though their mother, the three sisters, were great-granddaughters of Henry VII, great-nieces of Henry VIII and first cousins once removed of Edward VI, Mary I and Elizabeth I. Jane received a humanist education from John Elmer, speaking Latin and Greek from an early age, also studying Hebrew and Italian. Through the influence of her father and her tutors, she became a committed Protestant, who also corresponded with the Zurich reformer, Henrik Bullinger. She preferred academic studies rather than activities such as hunting parties, and allegedly regarded her strict upbringing, which was typical for the time, as harsh. To the visiting scholar Roger Ascombe, who found her reading Plato, she is said to have complained. For when I am in the presence either of father or mother, whether I speak, keep silent, sit, stand, or go, eat, drink, be merry or sad, be sewing, playing, dancing, or doing anything else, I must do it, as it were such a weight, measure and number, even so perfectly as God made the world, or else I am so sharply taunted, so cruelly threatened, yea presently, sometimes with pinches, nips and bobs, and other ways, which I will not name for the honour I bear them, that I think myself in hell. Around February 1547, Jane was sent to live in the household of Edward VI's uncle, Thomas Seymour, who soon married Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr. Jane lived with the couple at Sudley Castle in Gloucestershire as an attendant to Catherine, until Catherine died in childbirth in September 1548. Jane acted as chief mourner at Catherine Parr's funeral. Thomas Seymour showed continued interest to keep her in his household, and she returned for about two months before he was arrested at the end of 1548. Seymour's brother, the Lord Protector, Edward Seymour, first Duke of Somerset, felt threatened by Thomas' popularity with the young King Edward. Among other things, Thomas Seymour was charged with proposing Jane as a bride for the King. In the course of Thomas Seymour's following attainder and execution, James' father was lucky to stay out of trouble. After his fourth interrogation by the King's Council, he proposed his daughter Jane as a bride for the Protector's eldest son, Lord Hertford. Nothing came of this, however, and Jane was not engaged until 25th of May 1553, her bridegroom being Lord Guildford Dudley, a younger son of John Dudley, the first Duke of Northumberland. The Third Succession Act of 1544 restored Henry VIII's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, to the line of succession. Henry's will reinforced the succession of his three children and then declared that, should none of them leave descendants, the throne would pass to the heirs of his younger sister, Mary, which included Jane. For reasons unknown, Henry excluded Jane's mother, Francis Grey, from the succession and also bypassed the claims of the descendants of his elder sister, Margaret, who had married into the Scottish royal house and nobility. 
When the 15-year-old Edward VI lay dying in early summer 1553, his Catholic half-sister Mary was still his heir presumptive. Edward, in a draft will, composed earlier in 1553, had first restricted the succession to male descendants of Francis Brandon and her daughters, before he named his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane, and her heirs male. As his successors, probably in June 1553, the intent was to ensure his Protestant legacy, thereby bypassing Mary, a Roman Catholic. Edward VI personally supervised the copying of his will, which was formally issued as letters patent on the 21st of June and signed by 102 notables, among them the whole Privy Council, peers, bishops, judges and London eldermen. Edward also announced to have his declaration passed in Parliament in September and the necessary writs were prepared. The King died on the 6th of July 1553 but his death was not announced until four days later. On the 9th of July Jane was informed that she was now Queen and according to her own late claims accepted the crown only with reluctance. On the 10th of July she was officially proclaimed Queen of England, France and Ireland after she had taken up secure residence in the Tower of London where English monarchs customarily resided from the time of their ascension until coronation. Needing an act of parliament, Jane refused to name her husband Dudley as king. The Duke of Northumberland, Jane's father-in-law, faced a number of key tasks to consolidate his power after Edward's death. Most importantly, he had to isolate and ideally capture Mary Tudor to prevent her from gathering support. As soon as Mary was sure of King Edward's demise, she left her residence at Hunsdon and set out for East Anglia where she began to rally her supporters. Northumberland set out from London with troops on the 14th of July to capture Mary. The Privy Council then switched their allegiance and proclaimed Mary Queen on the 19th of July. The historical consensus assumes that this was in recognition of overwhelming support of the population for Mary. Jane is often called the Nine Day Queen, although if her reign is dated from the moment of Edward's death on the 6th of July 1553, her reign could have been a few days longer. On the 19th of July 1553, Jane was imprisoned in the Tower of London in the jailer's apartment and her husband in the Boucham Tower. Her father-in-law, the Duke of Northumberland, was then executed on the 22nd of August, 1553. In September, Parliament declared Mary the rightful successor and denounced and revoked Jane's proclamation as that of a usurper. Now referred to by the court as Jane Dudley, wife of Guildford, Jane was charged with high treason, as were her husband, two of her brothers and the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranber. Their trial, by special commission, took place on the 13th of November 1553 at Guildhall in the City of London. As was to be expected, all defendants were found guilty and sentenced to death. Jane's guilt of having treacherously assumed the title and the power of the monarch was evidenced by a number of documents that she had signed Jane the Queen. Her sentence was to be burned alive on Tower Hill or beheaded at the Queen's pleasure. But Mary intended to spare her life. The rebellion of Thomas Wyatt the Younger in January 1554 against Queen Mary's marriage plans with Philip of Spain sealed Jane's fate. Her father, Henry Grey, first Duke of Suffolk and two of his brothers joined the rebellion and so the government decided to go through with the verdict against Jane and Guildford. Their execution was first scheduled for the 9th of February 1554, but was then postponed for three days to give Jane a chance to convert to the Catholic faith. On the morning of 12th of February 1554, the authorities took Guildford from his rooms at the Tower of London to the public execution place at Tower Hill 
where he was beheaded. A horse and car brought his remains back to the tower, past the rooms where Jane was staying. Seeing her husband's corpse return, Jane is reported to have exclaimed, Oh Guildford, Guildford. She was then taken out to Tower Green inside the tower to be beheaded. According to the account of her execution given by the anonymous chronicle of Queen Jane and the two years of Queen Mary, Jane gave a speech upon ascending the scaffold. Good people, I have come hither to die, and by the law I am condemned to the same. The fact indeed against the Queen's Highness was unlawful and the consenting thereunto me, by touching the procurement and desire thereof by me, or on my behalf. I do wash my hands thereof in innocence, before God, and the face of you, good Christian people, this day. Jane then recited Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, in English, and handed her gloves and handkerchief to her maid. The executioner then stepped forward and asked her forgiveness, which she granted him, pleading, I pray you dispatch me quickly. Referring to her head, she asked, Will you take it off before I lay me down? The axeman answered, No, madam. She then blindfolded herself. Jane failed to find the block with her hands and cried, What shall I do? Where is it? Probably Sir Thomas Bridges, the deputy lieutenant of the tower, helped her find her way. With her head on the block, Jane spoke the last words of Jesus as recounted by Luke. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The axe then fell in one clean stroke. Jane was just sixteen or seventeen years old. Jane and her husband are buried in the chapel of St. Peter on the north side of Tower Green. No memorial stone was erected at their grave, but Jane will forever be known as the Nine Day Queen. <laughs>